Hi, I'm Rhonda Pick, Managing Editor with Poultry Health Today. With me is Dr. David French, Staff Veterinarian with Sanderson Farms. Welcome. Hi, Rhonda. Thank you. Great to have you here. Thank you. So we're going to talk a little bit about respiratory disease okay. and specifically um, in broilers and some experiences that you've recently had in your operation that are fairly unique. Why don't you uh, share a little bit about the case and some findings that you've learned? Sure. Uh, so yeah, here we are at uh, AAAP meeting and a uh, case report on uh, uh, respiratory disease that uh, seemed to be associated with a bacterial septicemia uh, that was unique to three separate broiler uh, breeder flocks, broiler breeder flocks in two different divisions. So it was a rather specific case report that I was giving. Uh, unusual circumstance for a case report in that I don't necessarily have a definitive answer. We have what we think was the cause. But one of the reasons I like to come to a, a venue like this to talk about case reports is a lot of times you'll get feedback from the audience after such a report that might give you some confirmation, some additional ideas that you might not have thought to look into. And sometimes it generates an interest in additional studies. What were you, what were you seeing in, in your flock and at what age? And just dig a little bit deeper into what you were seeing. Sure, in this particular scenario, we had uh, broilers that were getting sick around 35 to 40 days of age. Uh, the broilers had severe fibrin production in the abdominal cavity, uh, particularly around the heart. They had a pericarditis, a perihepatitis, and a polycericitis uh, that was so dramatic that visiting veterinarians were grabbing their cameras to get pictures of it. So wow. it was, it was a quite a dramatic uh, gross lesion that you could observe. Uh, as we began to look at it, uh, we performed uh, routine epidemiological questions. Uh, where did this come from? What's the relationship? Uh, and we were able to narrow it down to these three specific breeder flocks that the problem was coming from. It's unusual though for a bacterial septicemia not to cause mortality in the first week. And that was the report we were constantly getting from the field was we had no problems with early mortality, but the birds were dying at 35 to 40 days of age. It doesn't make sense for a bacteria that comes from a breeder flock to not kill chicks in the first week of age, but to kill them later at 35 to 40. So that was the thing that made it unique. And that's what got our attention. So th were the three flocks in close geographical proximity to each other? They were in uh, two separate divisions. So uh, they weren't that far apart, uh, maybe a couple of hours apart. Two of the breeder flocks were, were in one division in Texas. Uh, the other breeder flock was in a separate division. We looked for, again, for epidemiological uh, sources. How did this get in those three breeder flocks and, and then dispersed to those broader progeny? Mm -hmm and could not find any connection there with regard to movement of birds, movement of people. Uh, we never really found an answer why it simultaneously occurred in those three breeder flocks. There was no movement of, there, we do sometimes have, as most companies have, a, a movement of males from one flock to another that yep. we use for spiking, but we did not have any movement between those two divisions. So it, again, it was a very mysterious, uh, simultaneous uh, occurrence of this disease in two different divisions that were separated by about 120 miles. Okay, so from a diagnostic standpoint, let's talk a little bit about that. What, what were your actions? What kind of diagnostic um, investigation did you do and what did you learn? So we looked at everything. Uh, we, started with, uh, we started with the serious considerations, viral diseases. Uh, we ran the gamut of, of every possible viral disease you can imagine, starting with avian influenza and, and working our way working to the, the milder ones. Working yes, the list, we yeah. worked the entire list. <laughs> the only thing that we were able to find on a routine basis, we thought we might have some impact of bursal disease in one of the breeder flocks, but uh, we did not see that in the other two. Okay. Um, that was the only viral component that we saw in all of this. Uh, from a bacterial standpoint, from something in excess of 35 different laboratory submissions from wow. broader flocks, we found a fairly consistent isolation of E. coli, which is a fairly common bacteria to find in poultry. Yep. It's in the environment, it's, you're gonna find it if you're looking for it. Uh, we also found in about 25% of the cases, uh, maybe a little bit less than that, 14 to 25% of the cases, we found uh, uh, Enterococcus secorum. Uh, so the Enterococcus secorum is what really got our attention. And uh, while we made no definitive diagnosis, it was on our list of highly suspicious organisms. The thing that's unique about Enterococcus secorum though is, Usually that's associated with a totally different picture in broilers. It's usually associated with a condition called spinal abscess, where that, that bacteria grows in one of the vertebrae, produces an abscess in that vertebrae, and it pinches the spinal cord, which causes a paralysis of the, of the, uh, of the legs, basically. 
Um, but we didn't see that in these birds. It was a totally different picture. It was more of a respiratory presentation. So then that begs the question, are there other organisms that might be evol involved along with the Enterococcus sicorum that might complicate the picture? So now you've identified that you have a fairly unusual challenge in front of you. What do you do with your, your broilers? Start there. So, so broilers and breeders. So we, yep. We've also identified it to three specific breeder flocks. Right. So fortunately on the breeder side, uh, I'll start there first. On okay. the breeder side, they were up in age. Uh, two of the flocks were in excess of 50 weeks of age. So uh, one of them was almost uh, 61, 62 weeks of age. We usually uh, are finished with our breeder flocks at 63 uh, weeks of age. We no longer set eggs from them past that age. So one of them aged out fairly quickly. Okay. The other one aged out relatively short period of time after that. But we still had one breeder flock that was considerably younger and continuing to produce, yeah. continuing to produce eggs and broilers from that particular breeder flock. So on the broiler side, we discovered that Treating with, uh, with tetracycline, oxytetracycline, was beneficial. Uh, in fact, I did not have a case where I had to treat uh, a specific house that was breaking that didn't respond to oxytetracycline. So that was beneficial. And because of that beneficial impact, we went back to the breeder flock and treated them as well to see if we could clean up the source of the problem so that we wouldn't have that problem in the, in the broiler progeny. And it was successful in taking care of the problem. Okay. Any other considerations on, on things you've, you've learned from the situation that you'd um, give it for as far as advice to other people or key learnings? Yeah, I think, that, uh, I think that history is critically important and gaining input from the locals that are dealing with the disease uh, and putting together your epidemiological strategy I think is critical. Uh, for our two divisions, for example, one division recognized immediately that it was related to the broiler breeder flocks that we were working with. The other division uh, that we were working with said, no, 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 that can't be it. It must be that we have a sh relatively short downtime. And when you have short downtime, your disease challenge is a little bit higher. Okay. So for a while, I ignored the second division because that was a situation that we could take care of. We knew what was causing it. We thought we knew what was causing that. But as the disease progressed and epidemiology continued, we realized there is in fact a source flock that's generating this problem. So asking the right questions, doing the epidemiology, where did it come from, gives you an idea of how to approach solving the problem. We've been visiting with Dr. David French, staff veterinarian with Sanderson Farms.